Beg your pardon. You heard me. Hit the brickwork. Come on, spread out. That goes for little Miss Muffet as well. Welcome to episode 24 of the Jonathan Creek podcast, where one of us is spread out and the other is little Miss Muffet. Is that a tuffet that you're sitting on over there, Jerry? Just looks that way. Huh. What's that beside you? Curtain way spider. Hmm. How are you? I'm very well this week, Jerry. How are you? 70%. It's not too bad no. compared to where you've been. Yeah, as you know, suffering from a nasty bout of tonsillitis. Just getting over it. I'm not sure if the voice will hold up for an hour's worth of podcasting. We'll, we'll keep our fingers crossed one way or the other. <laughs> I'm sure plenty of people will. <laughs> the seer in the sands is what we're going to discuss today. Yeah, it's a remarkable episode. In some ways. In other ways, utterly contrived. Well, there's plenty to remark on, in a way. Yeah. <laughs> Which we'll get to, no doubt. I prefer to call it the bullshitter on the beaches. Okay. <laughs> the con artist at the cove. Any more alliteration before we begin? No. None. Managed to prepare a summary? As always. Crack on. In the Seer of the Sands, Jonathan and Carla are asked to explain a remarkable feat of psychic communication. Following the death of Justin Mallory, a well-known sceptic, his bereaved partner is offered comfort by a passing medium. With serious financial consequences hinging on the credibility of the dead man's posthumous words, can Jonathan expose the fraud, or is this one mystery that defies explanation? We shall see her. Uh, tumbleweed. The coastal home of Justin Mallory is where we begin this week, and we can see from a number of books and posters that he is apparently a famous ghost hunter. Yeah, I think more of a an exposer of the... Nonsense. Yes. Uh, he examines the, apparently the secrets and methodology of psychic tricksters. Good. He is lying resting on his bed with an eye mask on. And we see someone creep in to a menacing score and we have the familiar Jonathan Creek point of view shot. Yes, I think we're meant to feel this person has malicious intent. Yeah, it looks as if he has a, a stash of chloroform on him. It does look that way, but it's just cleaning fluid of some kind. It is. It's little Mickey the butler. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that, that seems to be about it. Yeah, a live-in butler from what I can tell. Mm -hmm. Who is attempting to clean a very smeary photograph. He is. I'd uh, be asking why there's smears in that photo. Well, that, that comes up. Mm -hmm. I'd be asking him. Right. <laughs> Justin says he's got a migraine. He does. And asks Mickey to, to leave it alone for now. So in the garden, Mickey's there tending it, but soon gets himself covered in little pests. Yeah. Bugs of some kind. Mm-hmm. wonder if that's foreshadowing. No chance. No. no. Nothing so silly. Sometime later, back in the house, Mallory gets up and puts on some old jazz music as we see a fax arrive for him. Is that contemporary? Nope, we'll get to that. Okay. <laughs> He's disgusted with the content of this message. Dis as I said, distressed. I, th I thought disgusted. He certainly seemed unhappy anyway. Mm -hmm. He screws the, the message up in a ball and throws it onto the floor. And heads down to the beach with a, a bottle of a bourbon. As you do. Yeah. Did you understand what the whole thing with the plastic clips over the top of the, the bottles of whiskey were? I didn't recognise what that was meant to be, but it showed you a close-up of a little red bit of plastic. Yeah, no, that was just to highlight the fact that it was the same bottle that's found right. buried. Okay. And the beach is where we go next. And looking quite reckless, Mallory gets into this speedboat of his. How do you look reckless? Well, a bit of gear abandon. <laughs> and he heads out to sea. At the same time, we see Mickey find and read the facts that was thrown on the, the floor beside the empty bottle. Absolutely. Or a near-empty bottle, I, I should say. He's not a total clown. Yeah, a near-empty is what I've said. Near-empty <laughs> whiskey bottle. We cut back to Justin and his boat, who aggressively beaches it 
and is thrown from the, the yeah. boat. Looks like he's trying to play chicken with a, a set of rocks. Yeah, it's not the wisest move. No. And he ends up um, dying face down in the water. Yeah, a woman wanders along and recognises him and is shocked to discover that he's died. Yeah, she's Ashley, I think we come to learn. And she knows the man is Mr Mallory, so it's it's not a stranger. Yeah, he's not gone far. No. Oh. So Ashley runs up to tell Mickey and they both head back down in a panic, obviously. And as they do go down there, we get some exposition from Ashley. Well, she wonders why he would get drunk and take a boat out when he's the, the most level-headed man in the universe. <laughs> he's a ghost hunter. <laughs> it seems hyperbole, hyperbolic, yeah. yeah. He's a man who's decided that his career will be hunting ghosts. <laughs> yes. The pair are in for an imminent surprise. Yes, what's that? They get back to the boat and the body has gone. Yeah, we can discuss that later. Do we find out how the body disappeared if she ran up to alert Mickey? Well, there must be a time gap. Must be. Okay. Anyway, she speculates at this stage that his body's simply been washed out to sea. I think she says something like the sea has taken him, or I can't remember the exact words. Something yeah, stupid. Is that, yeah. I don't think so. No. We're on the street next, where Jonathan is with Adam, who himself is trying his hand at the hip new thing of street magic. Yeah. Um... So he's left the, the theatre, the more um, the David Copperfield and he's... Swapped out for more David Blaine. Or who is it these days? Dynamo. Is he still... Well, I saw him recently look really old all of a sudden. Who, David Blaine? Dynamo. Oh, Dynamo. Yeah. I've never watched him. Blaine must look quite old. I would think so. He was quite old to start with. Doing stupid things for days on end. Yeah. Pretentious pain in the back. How's it magic to stand in a box? It's not. Is that an endurance feat, if anything? Yeah. I think I've got an autocorrect here because my next line in my notes makes no sense. It says, Cameraman wheelchair dining Adam. <laughs> what do you think that could be? Uh, I'm not sure But it, there seems to be a conversation about mentalism anyway Yes And Adam thinks that his discipline can still be demonstrated today Yes, but we see that it's in fact just a con What happens? Yeah, he, he approaches a number of people and, and if they don't give him the right answer He just moves on to somebody else And when he gets the right one That's it, recorded for their little documentary mm -hmm. I think that it looked like most of these people actually probably were just passers-by in the street. They didn't look like extras or actors. Yeah, so it, it does have that authentic feeling when he finally gets it right. Yeah. What is he? He's asking someone to pick a number. Yeah, pick a number from 1 to 50, and he's going to try and put it in their head, I think. Yeah. And... None of them choose the number. Well, yeah, we get kind of a, a quick cut of a number of folk giving the wrong answer until finally one man punches him. <laughs> And eventually somebody does guess 36 and he, I think he's got it written on him, he takes his shirt off or he lifts his shirt up and yeah. it's there and he's just like, oh, it's unbelievable. <laughs> Back to the beach and we see a, a different woman, Geraldine Vaccara. Yeah, she's driving the coast road. She's looking very mournful. Oh, I said wistful. Either or. Yeah. Before knocking on the door and having it answered by Mickey, she tells him that they don't know each other. Yes, he agrees, but he's been expecting her, he nonetheless. Hasn't. Yeah. We're at Pinewood now. Yes, it's up on the, the wall, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Adam is um, being filled in on the benefits of inclusiveness. Yeah, diversity, and agrees to take on a, a new security person. As we see Jonathan take a call that annoys him. Yeah, that's right. I didn't, we don't know what it is at this stage. No. I don't think Adam is really understanding the situation as as he asks the diversity woman on a date. Yeah, I think he is listening to her only insofar as it makes her listen to him. And yeah, he's, he's focused on the date rather than what he has to do to get the date. Yeah, and she's probably about to spurn him until introduced to Jonathan, who has, whilst on this call, has seated himself in a wheelchair. This is what my note earlier was. The cameraman was in the wheelchair. That's how they got the angle for the... The shot when they're walking down the street. Yes, that's Okay, it. that solves that mystery. Um, yeah, Jonathan's sitting in this wheelchair and the, the diversity woman believes he's a disabled member of staff and she praises Adam for his commitment to inclusiveness and diversity. Yeah, now for someone in this role, she seems very patronising. Yes, I don't think it's appropriate at all what she says. No. Her name's uh, Felicia, I think it is. And as she leaves, Jonathan tells Adam about his health and safety issue concerning the live python that is in their act. 
Yeah, apparently health and safety are cracking down. Gone mad. You can't even have pythons. PC gone mad. Terrible. Adam, however, thinks that his newfound relationship with the council, i.e. Felicia, will resolve this matter. Doesn't make any sense. No, she isn't involved in licensing wild animals. No, that's not how it works. No. You can't just speak to someone who works for the council and they can push some buttons for you. Not these days. Or those days. Yeah. Back to the beach house. Yes, Geraldine is there talking to Mickey and she advises him that she was Mallory's secret lover. Yes, secret American lover. Okay, has he got one in other countries as well? Probably. He's a sneaky little devil. (laughs) Mickey says he knew there was someone, but he didn't know who. That was that explains his comment when she arrived. Yes, and she can't understand why he wasn't delighted, as opposed to being suicidal. Yeah. Since she had just faxed him with some very good news. It turned out Rex, my husband, was finally ready to put us out of our misery and let go. I wanted to call desperately to tell him, but... I was already late for a meeting, so I just fired it off like like a quick one-liner to make his day. Guess what? Pressing Rex for a divorce again this morning. He said no one would have to suffer much longer. Talk to you tonight, Geraldine. In the way it was all screwed up on the floor, I'd say this was the very thing that upset him. But that's not logical. I mean, there's no way we're getting the whole picture here. Sadly, the only one who can make sense of it isn't here anymore. Well, then again, you know, he was desperate to believe there was something else. But all those years, knee-deep in scams and con tricks, cranky mediums and phony psychics, what did he ever find to give him one grain of hope? I don't know, Mr. Daniels. Wouldn't that be his greatest triumph? If Justin Mallory, ghost hunter, returned to us now, to explain his own death. Yeah, a number of issues with that clip there. I don't think there's anything in that clip I don't have issues with. No. We'll start with the uh, dashing off a quick fax. It's 2004. Everyone was using emails. It would have taken longer to go and find a pen, a piece of paper, write a note and then fax it. Find the telephone number you have to fax it to. Yeah. Uh, you would have sent an email. Uh, or perhaps a, a text. I know that in America... I think you said to me earlier that texts weren't quite as uh, prevalent as in the UK perhaps but yeah. still everyone was using Blackberries and what have you you'd have sent an email or some sort of digital communication it was an obvious plot contrivance I would say so I mean obviously there might be an additional cost as well for a text but nothing email would be absolutely fine but here's everyone th- in that time had a hotmail account or whatever it yeah, was yeah but even that you're saying an additional cost she is not a 13 year old girl yeah we find out she's dealing with hundreds of millions of pounds of contracts. Yeah, she could handle it. Yeah, she's a businesswoman. It's a company account. It's not. Her, she's not got a data limit or whatever. I wouldn't have thought. I'm sure she can handle a forty pence text. Yeah, yeah. The fact doesn't add up. No, it's a plot contrivance. The other thing as well was we heard there that uh, no, it's more. Like she's describing him more as a, someone who's out there to find the truth as opposed to being a a, a psychic, a, a scam buster. Yeah, the, the impression I got was very much that Ghost Hunter was him exposing, that yeah. was his, the, the line he used, or the tagline he used. Yes. Because he was exposing fraud. Definitely, when we hear Ashley later describing him as thinking in a similar way to Jonathan. Right. Like very logical. Yeah, well, there you go. Yeah, so he's not trying to, he's not going to be disappointed that he's found nothing. I'm sure he expects to find nothing. Yeah. Uh, she seems a bit of an oddball. And maybe she's just grief racked. Maybe. Anyway, we're back over to Pinewood in an editing suite, where Adam is pleased. Yeah. (laughs) But Jonathan's got an explanation for him. Adam's excited about the positive responses from people in the street to his work. But Jonathan explains, no, no, this was the footage when people saw you standing in that um, dog crap. (laughs) And at this point, Adam gets a call to come down to meet his new bodyguard, Joseph. Yes, he heads out and as he does, he passes Carla, who's coming to invite Jonathan for a coffee. Yeah, she's in the in the neighbourhood, as it were, with Baxter. Is she? Is he there? Yeah, I think they're working on a, a programme in the in Pinewood. Okay, 
that might be a bit that's missing from I watched this on Netflix. So yeah, no, I think she just says that. I mean, she that. says he's there. Okay, he, yeah, he doesn't appear. Not at this point. No. Okay, that's fine. I, I couldn't. I'm trying to figure out what I've missed. So we'll try and piece it together as we go yeah. through. So downstairs we go, where Adam discovers Joseph is not exactly what he had been expecting. <laughs> yes, and he, Joseph's a, a small person, and Adam. I think he throws in a line about being above all that, mm. which is inappropriate. Yeah. But not only is he a dwarf, mm -hmm. he's a an obnoxious little turd. That's not connected. It's not? No. no but, he, a, but he is. But he's yes. a horrible little person. Yes, he is. He's not a nice man. No. He's very extreme. I think he's a dirty Harry. Yeah, I think we heard at the top of the show what happened next when Jonathan and Carla stopped by. Yeah, he's pulling out guns and frisking people who happen to walk anywhere near Adam. Yeah, at one point he fires his gun. Yeah. Oh, Must it's... be a cap gun, surely. He's not running about with a gun. Who knows? Maybe he's got his security guard badge and that lets him get a gun. Hmm. We're back over to the beach. Geraldine sits on a rug and gazes out at the ocean before starting at a crossword and then knocking over an orange as she lies back to close her eyes and have a little rest. As she does, uh, a woman stands over her. Yeah, she hands back this orange, <laughs> just like in The Godfather. Sure. Uh, and she says something along the lines of, it's a very lovely spot, but for you there is sadness here. Yeah, she's a, she's meant to be a, a mystic New Age type. Mm. I think through my notes I've just referred to her as a con woman. Yeah, that's like the, the other week I had the fascist policeman, I didn't have his name. Yeah. I don't have her name down. I don't know if she had a name. Did she have a name? She Con, did. Con woman. She did have a name because Geraldine knew it when Jonathan asked yeah, her, but I didn't, I didn't no. write it down. She's at it anyway. She then describes the accident, but this is a this is public information, surely. Yes. There's been a massive crash and death on the beach. Everyone would know about it. I would say so. And she talks about what it must mean to Geraldine, but again, that's fairly obvious. Yeah. She says that someone whose life was lost near here wishes to communicate. Now, Geraldine obviously opened the door to this in our previous scene. Mm -hmm. and she said, oh, it'd be great if the ghost hunter came back from the dead as a ghost. Yep. Now, here's the thing as well, this type of nonsense always irritates me. She says, oh, you've got five questions. Why would you only have five? Who's limiting this to five questions? <laughs> Ooh, I will not answer <laughs> six. Ooh. Yeah, I won't give you a straight answer. I'll just talk in, in initials and... Yeah, but what else has he got to do? <laughs> he's, he's dead. <laughs> <laughs> You've got five <laughs> questions. I'm a busy man. I need to get back for East Enders. Yeah. Garbage. So, anyhow, Geraldine being vulnerable in a state at this point, yeah. asks her five questions. Can you remember what they were? Yes. Okay, tell me. Okay, number one, how are you? <laughs> Dead. Dead, yeah. Been better. Yeah. Number two, where are you? Nowhere. Yeah. Uh, Number three, how did you die? <laughs> Look at the wreckage of my boat. <laughs> Im yeah, it's imbecile. <laughs> it's like she's trying to trick her. Oh. Yeah. Uh. Number four, do you still love me? No, mm. I'm dead. <laughs> uh, and number five, what's the answer to 17 across? <sighs> at this point, I'd be saying, sorry, we're, we're not answering, you don't deserve these questions. Yeah. Yeah, I, I wish for a million wishes. Yeah. That, that's old, uh, <laughs> exactly. So this old uh, corn witch then says that the questions have already been answered and are beneath her in the sands before she leaves Geraldine to dig up what? A whiskey bottle. I think the it's, whiskey bottle. Yeah. Um, although how did they get that? Uh, who knows? It's got a note inside. Yeah, it's a piece of parchment. Ooh. We're back at the house. Yes, the note has answered all of the questions. Yes. A shocked but delighted Geraldine shows this paper to uh, Mickey and it apparently contains yeah, these answers. Yeah. So, tell me what the answers are. Okay, how are you? I'm good. <sighs> okay. For, I'm good. for being dead. <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> Crap answer. Okay. Where are you? I have passed beyond. Yeah. <laughs> Rubbish again. <laughs> I love the next one. How do you die? I crashed my boat. Yeah. <laughs> Idiot. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't take Columbo or Jonathan Creek to work that out. Number four, do you still love me? No, I've met Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh. And the, the crossword answer is gruesome. Mm -hmm. Mickey is obviously sceptical, but Geraldine is convinced that uh, Mallory is still with him. 
Yep. Yeah. This woman apparently is in charge of hundreds of millions of pounds worth of contract. Once they find out, they should just fire her. They should do, yeah. Over to the studio. Yeah, Baxter's office, I believe. Yes, he's reading a book called Chasing the Hollywood Dream by Alvin Turtlebaum. <laughs> yeah, and it seems to have changed his mood in some way. Yeah, he seems kind of contemplative, doesn't he? Yeah. As Carla enters and tells him about the meeting with Jonathan. Yeah, she's poking for a response, I think. Yeah, because I think Baxter asks how Jonathan is and he says he's quite fine. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Uh, double entendre there. Yeah, she wonders whether it's ever sunk in with Brendan that she was quite attached to Jonathan at one time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> There's a weird comment about never lowering the little drawbridge. That doesn't even make sense as a metaphor. Yeah. So opening the gates as opposed to the drawbridge. Yeah, what what drawbridge are you lowering? What what is wrong with you? Yeah. yeah let's not. <laughs> One of the had their moments. Yeah. So However, Baxter has something of his own to tell Carla. Yeah. He says life's full of lost liaisons and she says they have trust and the fact that she's still friendly with an old boyfriend shouldn't be a big deal. And Brendan says, or that I was once married to a man. <laughs> now, is this homophobic humour? Yeah. Oh, well, I think it's like, no, he's, no, he was gay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think Carla's uh, reaction is, um, yeah, again, not progressive. He immediately flicks the switch and starts talking about the book he was reading. Mm-hmm. Which is connected, but we don't know that at this stage. No. Down in the car park. We see the python arrive. Yeah, it's quite hissy. Ah. And Jonathan receives a call from Mickey. Mm-hmm. Now, I can't remember. How, what's the connection between Mickey and Jonathan? I don't know. It's, I've not got a note here. Do we find out later? I mean, Jonathan's quite well known at this stage as a guy who solves mysteries. Yeah, I suppose. Mickey's maybe thinking that this woman's being conned. Yeah. But why does he care? It's not his problem. She's no. not hurting anything. Anyway, back up in Baxter's office, we see a, a picture of him and Turtlebaum at their wedding. Yes. He explains it was his first time in America, he was young and impulsive, and it was a marriage of convenience that opened a lot of doors. Yeah, but as mentioned, she doesn't take this very well or appropriately. Well, I've got to say appropriately, but you would be shocked if you found out your husband had been married to a man and hadn't told you. It'd be very shocking news. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't think we should judge her on her immediate reaction because it's maybe not her rational reaction. Mm. She probes as to the the consummation of his marriage, but he insists they definitely did not have a co-production deal <laughs> before accurately pulling her up in her homophobia. But like like we said, it's is a shocking revelation. Yeah, I think that's fair to say. I mm. think we give her a a bit of leeway. Yeah. I don't think she's picking on all gay people. It's just her husband yeah. and the shock. And I, th- I think this is a, a slight. On, on Baxter as well I mean you would sort of probably you should have probably told your wife that yeah. you were once married to a man it's, it's not an insignificant detail my bigger problem with it is, is it seems to be written as humorous I think the audience are expected to laugh at this idea of him being married to a man which I don't think is ideal Well, uh, let's give, give them the benefit of the doubt They're, you're meant to laugh at the fact that he had done it and didn't consider it worthwhile even mentioning that's, mm-hmm. that's the joke Okay. You know, had this been brought up, it's it, a lot of charity. Well, no, I mean, I, I think it was a relationship, and Carla had mentioned the fact that she knew about it before. You wouldn't be laughing at it. It's just the whole shock, this revelation. Okay, Carla accuses Brendan of having been duplicitous and insensitive. I'm not sure that's fair. It happened before he met her. He can't change it. Insensitive, I think, in not telling his wife. Maybe he felt it was sensitive to not tell her. That sort of you know, keeping those sort of secrets. Um, generally advisable well people do of course they do (laughs) anyway she storms off and luckily for her straight into the incoming jonathan this has happened a couple of times in this episode they seem to be gravitating towards one another Mm. so they're now in the car together i think jonathan has invited her along for this yeah because of this mystery that they're going to look at yeah and after some more casual homophobia from Jonathan this oh, it's, time. It's not casual in any way, it's blatant. Yeah. Oh, I'm not even going to repeat the joke because it's neither funny. It's, what I've written down, neither funny nor appropriate. <laughs> anyway, they're off to see uh, Mickey and Geraldine. Yeah, Carl asks about Mallory in the car. Mm. So we arrive at the beach house where Jonathan immediately recognises something as a scam. Oh, there's no question it's a trick. 
and a bloody good one. Professionally and very meticulously plotted. Which begs the inevitable question. Why? Credulous Californian who's desperate to make contact with her dear departed. I suppose it's a cinch she's going to lap it all up. And what if... You're saying they never did find his body again. How can we be sure he was actually dead? You just have to take my word for that. Oh, Ashley. Um... Took care of all the paperwork. Dictation, whatever. And I think that's the last of the acknowledgements for the signature. Sadly, I come from a family of undertakers, and I've seen what goes inside a coffin too often to be fooled. Ashley then goes on to tell Jonathan that Mallory was a, a fan of his and that they had similar ways of looking at things. Yeah. Which is why I said earlier, I don't think he was trying to seek, you know, any, any yeah, sort of truths. I agree with your interpretation of that one. Mm. We next see the old corn witch yeah, approach. But you know, it was the last thing that she said previously, not that I will not pass this way again. Maybe she meant the beach. <laughs> Yeah, she's talking to Geraldine and I think they're in a boathouse. No, it's a horse-drawn cart that she's pulled up in. Okay, they go to the boathouse. Oh, they don't, yes, sorry. After that, they go to the, the boat shed. Right, okay. And you've got Jonathan and Carla lurking behind a tin of paint. Yeah. This is the bit where the, the woman is trying to influence Geraldine. So she's feeding her additional information. Now that she's done the hook mm -hmm. with the bottle, she's now putting in things about... Journeys to places of angels and gentle waters to bid farewell to the king. Yeah, but she talks about going on a journey soon. I mean, F me, she's got an American accent. It's hardly a leap. Yeah. Well, yes. Um, and she knows that, yeah, this Geraldine makes the connection. It's Los Angeles and this is the name of her office building. What a coincidence. Yeah. And this is where we get a line about a man of peace should be chosen as a, over a man of war. Mm. Which she interprets as being relative to these tenders that she has to decide about. And she assumes that uh, Rex, her husband, is the, the king, because Rex means king. Mm -hmm. Geraldine has one more question, which is really a, the final test that's going to verify for her that her ex, is, or that her former partner is indeed communicating with her. Yes. What's that? What's they the have a, a safe word, a code word, that they never reveal to anybody else. Um, so she wants this woman to provide the code word and that'll verify everything. But of course, being a con woman, she can't do this and ends up performing some sort of dramatics. And she screams and says there's a destructive force, some other influence. Of course. While they've been watching, Jonathan and Carla have been under the drip, drip, drip of a, a large container of something sticky, probably glue. I'd imagine it's to seal boats when they... Get a puncture. Yeah, maybe tar. Yeah. And in any event, they are stuck to one another by the hair, mm -hmm. which makes for an awkward um, tracking adventure as they follow the woman when she leaves. Yeah, we see her leave by her cart, and Jonathan and Carla have now become this item of sort. And it's a, a two and a half mile journey until Jonathan is forced to... He has to carry Carla, <laughs> yeah. Jonathan isn't up to that. No chance. No, that wouldn't work. For two and a half miles. I can't even carry my kid. No. Half a mile. And Jonathan isn't in any shape to be carrying people. No. The woman is met. Anyway, they do keep close enough to see this. Met at a campsite by a man with long white hair. Mm. Back to the beach house. Mickey has prepared a massive meal. Far too much pasta. Uh, and as they eat, we find that Jonathan and Carla have owned up to this snooping as he is certain it is a con, and they know nothing about the uh, the gypsy. Yeah, Geraldine's not happy about their cynicism. She believes that this malevolent force intervened to block the code word. But for Jonathan, this is obviously clear proof that the woman's at it. Because it is clear proof that the woman's at it. Yeah, so there's nothing they can do. They decide to, to wait and see what happens. Yeah. We bit later on, I think Geraldine's left the room and Mickey has a, has a word with Jonathan. Yes, he tells him he's a bit unnerved. He liked Mallory as a person, but not as a ghost. <laughs> Quite like that line. Yeah. He also reveals that the house will go to Mallory's brother in New Zealand, who is in no hurry to kick him out, before complaining about what? The fly. We saw these flies bothering him. I think we talked about this right at the top of the show. 
they seem to be seasonal and they're causing problems. Yeah, I think at this point they're on the ceiling above. Yeah. Jonathan then ponders a picture of Yosemite National Park and he thinks it's an odd image to have at your bedside. That's fair enough. Mm. Mickey says he never thought about how odd it was as he was always too busy trying to keep it clean from these smears. This is a weird thing to notice. Yeah, well, they appear daily, I suppose, if you were... I mean, how often? Even your cleaner, I mean, do you clean your... I never clean my photos, I have to say. Yeah. Clean my bathroom mirror most days, it's got smears in it. Let's stop talking about what we have to clean from of smears. <laughs> okay. I think we, we move ahead to the next day where Carla's not convinced that it's a trick, which is a weird thing for her to say. No, she's having a, a go at Jonathan's glib dismissal of this corn woman's supposed insight and the puzzle of the, the five answers in the bottle. Yeah, they're, they're down at the beach at this stage and Jonathan asks her to go and look in the huts and tell her what she tell him what she finds. Yeah, I think he tells her to clear her mind of any uh, preconceptions. Yeah. Okay, what does she discover inside? Okay, in the first hut she falls over, I think there's a, a loose floorboard in there and she doesn't go into the second hut and in the third one she finds a boot with a crab in it, which terrifies her. And attaches itself to her. Yes. She recovers the boot and assumes this is what Jonathan wanted her to find. Yeah. He has remained at the, the place where the, the bottle was found. Yeah. He didn't want the boot. No, he dismisses this and instead says that he was thinking more about the, the loose floorboard. Yeah, that fits in nicely with the, the idea that he has. And as Carla moans, Jonathan seems to have worked something out and then notices some black smoke in the distance coming from where the, the gypsy campsite was. Ooh. So that's where they head over. Yeah. So as they walk through a field towards this burning campsite, Jonathan, via flashback, lets Carla in on what he has deduced so far. Okay, let's start with the fact she'd already been to that same spot on the beach a couple of times before because of the rock. Clearly it would be impossible to plant a bottle there with a note in it after the event. Clearly. But what you could do is pre-rig the empty bottle. The trick then is to get the piece of paper inside without her noticing. And how is she supposed to have done that? Using a specially trained lugworm to nudge it in with its snout? Hold that thought, nurture it, and expand it into something a bit more practical and you're pretty much there. Because then I suggest all they needed was a very long hose pipe and some cable and a half decent radio connection. The most impressive thing was the speed with which he got that crossword clue. When you think there was no way of telling what she was going to fire at him, the guy must have had a pretty quick break. And that's where I've seen him before. Now suddenly this is making a lot more sense. Is it? Oh well that's a relief at any rate. We obviously couldn't hear from the clip there, Ian, but describe what Jonathan was describing. Yeah, a hose or a tube of some kind running from the bottle to the hut, coming up through the loose floorboard, and it looked like some kind of massive stick to poke the note through. Yeah. I thought maybe some kind of projector would have made sense. but mm -hmm. And the gypsy woman, obviously, she had a microphone, yes, which was transmitting she was the, yeah. the questions. Uh, mm. Jonathan is a bit of an arse in that clip Take that thought, hold it, not nurture it, expand upon it It's like, John, just tell me the answer, eh? It reminds me of a physics teacher I had at school Did not enjoy his class No just, Yeah, help me, I'm, I've, I've asked you for help Help me, don't <laughs> not offer <it>. sarcasm <laughs> Hold it uh -huh. Yeah Anyway, yeah, no, we we're at the campsite now uh, And as they arrive, what do they find? A charred corpse in a burning caravan uh, Staring out at them Yes, creepy we're back to the beach house next. Okay, I don't have this scene. This is not on Netflix. Really? Yeah. Is it oh, important? Uh, well, I'll tell you what happens and you can decide. Okay. So the knowledge of this fire only reinforces Geraldine's belief in otherworldly messages and a malevolent presence that wanted to silence the, the conduit of Mallory. So is there some sort of assumption that the body that they found was the gypsy woman? Yeah. But I take it it wasn't. No, no, it wasn't. It was a plant. Okay. we find that later. I probably didn't have that scene either. <laughs> Jonathan reminds her that they don't even know if the gypsy's body... Jonathan, in fact, reminds her that they don't even know if it was the gypsy's body. And his explanation of how the trick was pulled off uh, does not go down too well with Geraldine. 
I like to believe it's um, Kenny Starkus's body. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That would be good. Yeah. More, li- more likely to be one of the, the showgirls, however. Unfortunately. Yeah. So we're back to Pinewood, where you pick it back up, Ian. Yeah. Um, you've got Joseph here being very rude to a lady bringing a package. Yeah, I've noted him as being the odious drunk. He's drinking straight out the bottle, whiskey bottle, and when Adam tries to take it from him, he passes out. Yeah, he face planks. <laughs> yeah. I think you've got the... I know this guy's not a nice character, but using... Uh, a small person as a comic relief character mm. is a bad trope. Yeah. That they shouldn't have done. No. I think they move him to sleep it off. They dump him in a pile of sacks. Yeah. yeah. And we're back to the beach house. Jonathan is now on the internet looking up the, the Magicians of America site for something that we don't know about. The American Magicians Association of America. <laughs> yeah, he keeps looking at this photo of Yosemite as well. Yeah. He prints off something. Why? I suppose that might have been a thing that I'm looking back trying to remember. I think people did print off websites. Yes, because they didn't have phones in their pocket that had the internet. You couldn't take the internet with you. Yeah. So rather than go to a web cafe and show someone <laughs> what you'd found, you'd print it off. Uh, the, he's identified this man, the man with the white hair. Yeah, Leo Jorgensen. That's him. He's a leading mentalist, mm. which means something different in Scotland. Apparently, yes. He is the man who has conceived the plan. His connections to organised crime. Yeah, really? Mm. Is there many magicians who are organised? <laughs> oh. like, what do we need? <laughs> we need a magician. <laughs> Not literally. <laughs> Get me Siegfried. <laughs> <laughs> oh, another one who's not been eaten. <laughs> I mean, Jonathan admits he doesn't know who the woman was, but having accomplished their con, the two bogus gypsies have now buggered back off to where they came from. No doubt, under a rock somewhere. He thinks that the skeleton was dug up from a local churchyard. Now, this is very unlikely. They're not out there. Do you know how hard it would be? Exhuming a corpse? How yeah. do you know which grave is going to have an actual skeleton in it? And that would be discovered. Yeah. You'd, be, you'd be as well just going and getting a, something from a, a medical shop. Yeah, it doesn't need even to be a real skeleton, does it? Not really, but I mean, if you open up a grave, it'll be discovered and they'll know it's a, you know, yeah. they'll, they'll know that anyway, it's a local graveyard. Yeah. But Mickey wants to know what their objective was. Good yeah, point. He, and Carla's not clear either. No. And jo- Jonathan refers them back to the conversation in the boathouse. And he also says that when he gets a reply to an email that he sent, he will have it all tied down, then cryptically says that he has a problem of a ghost to lay as he looks at the poster of Mallory. I like the way that they use this episode to show faxes as speedy and efficient and emails as slow and cumbersome <laughs> ways. You'll have to wait a few days. <laughs> an email response, yes. But I'll fire off a quick fax. <laughs> 2004. Yeah. You yeah, got away with that in 1996. Yeah, when you had to go somewhere to use the internet. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Where are we? Back at Pinewood, the Equalities woman is there and is greeted by Adam. I, know, I thought we were at the theatre this time as opposed to Pinewood. No, because, well, maybe if it's the theatre now, it was the theatre earlier, because it's where Joseph has been laid to sleep. So either way. Yeah. Who's Adam sitting beside? Not remember? No. A dummy of himself. Is it? Yeah, quite good actually. (laughs) Didn't even have to go back and see that, because that sounds quite good. Uh, I think he tells her he's going to show her something spectacular, which is a a double entendre. Uh Uh-huh. But. Bad news. Yeah, he gets. Yes, what is it? I th- does she not ask how Joseph's getting on at this stage? Yeah. I don't. I didn't write it down, but I think, I've, I, think I remember her doing that. Mm-hmm. And coincidentally, he has had a, a bit of an accident. Yeah. They've found the snake, though. Yes, he joins others, as we, we see where the snake is. Yes, it's on the sacks. Yeah. Where's Joseph? He's in the snake. <laughs> Shouldn't laugh. No, well, again, this is obviously why they've... Use some of Joseph's stature for this. It's, I don't think it's an appropriate joke. Snakes wouldn't eat people like this. It's not a realistic depiction of how snakes behave. No. So, especially not a python, it would strangle them and then... Maybe it did. Maybe it strangled them and then ate them. I don't think it would. No? No, I'm, I, it would be very unlikely to anyway. Okay. The beach house is where we are. Yeah. Night time and Carla is woken by a loud creak. Not Jonathan. <laughs> I don't have this scene again. Okay. Really? The whole scene? The next thing I've got after the sneaking Joseph is in the morning with the cup. Okay, I think there are a couple of things before then. Okay. So, 
Carla is woken by this loud creaking noise and gets up to investigate. I ruined we'd... your joke about Jonathan Creek there. I apologise. That's okay. <laughs> uh, but we don't see what the, the noise was. And the next morning, Jonathan logs on to his global-mail.org account. What a man. <laughs> yeah. To see what his inbox has in store for him. If he'd gone to Lycos, he could have got a choice of um, top-level domain endings for his email address. Oh, yeah, I've heard about yours before. <laughs> At the breakfast table, Geraldine finishes her tea and, to her delight, thinks that she has proof of the other side for Jonathan. Yes, the mysterious code word has appeared in the tea leaves. What was the code word? I didn't write that down. Really? I didn't, didn't, think that that was, didn't think that was relevant? It was a code word and she got it. It okay. was right. <laughs> Scarab. Was? Scarab, okay. Yeah. There's a twist though. Well, Jonathan concedes that he can't argue with it. Mm. What is the twist? He did it. <laughs> It proves that you can believe anything if you want to. How did he do it? I mean, physically, oh. how did he do it to the cup? Oh, yeah, I don't have no idea. Did he put some sort of toxic glue in there? Yeah, glue. He could have poisoned her when yeah. she's drinking her tea. Must have been, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but tell me that uh, this is really a massive contract. How did he discover what the, the code word was? I feel like we're offending people even talking about this because it's so dumb. We need to do it. He had established, I think, in an earlier conversation, we didn't talk about it, I don't think, but mm. um, Mallory and Geraldine had selected this by putting a... Oh, no, she says he... I think he put a pin in the dictionary. It's a figure of speech for a start. Yes, you don't literally put a pin in the dictionary. No. But Jonathan, being Jonathan, realised he would have put an actual pin in the dictionary, and if he just felt every page, only one would have the pinhole. Well, that's not true. For a start, the pinhole would go through more than one page. Yep. But, but more importantly, you wouldn't... You would just... If you wanted to use the dictionary uh, to come up with this word, you would just close your eyes and select a, a, a page, a page and put your finger on it and look up. Yeah. You wouldn't actually go and get a, a bit of garbage. And not only that, the pin was right under the word. What are the odds of a pin hitting the bit of the page that's right at a word instead no of a chance. definition? Or... No chance. Oh. Yeah, it's nonsense. The whole thing's rubbish. It is. It ruins it. So let's just skate over as if it didn't happen. He goes on to tell her that the death of Mallory and her work position left her open to cynical con people and then offers the motive for their involvement. The company you work for in LA, I should say practically run, is currently considering two major tenders for a construction project worth several hundred million dollars. A serious commission that's basically in your gift. Let's say one of the two parties doesn't want to leave it to chance. Backhanders are a bit risky these days, so they put our psychic expert, Mr. Jorgensen, on the case, with a brief to nudge you in the right direction without you really being aware of it. After a week or two tracking your movements, they come up with a plan. First of all, to hook you with that message in a bottle, and then follow it up with a load of cryptic pronouncements from the spirit world that steered you very carefully towards their client. Pacific Union and General and Western, Man of Peace and Man of War. Where the Man of Peace shall prevail over the Man so of War. Pacific must prevail. Right. The names of the two companies were a gift. Is it me, or does this all sound a bit batty? Oh, it's too batty for words. But in a country where Nancy Reagan's horoscope can affect foreign policy, Guess we should keep an open mind. No. 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 That was, that was nonsense. Absurdist nonsense. Yep. I'm not having it at all. Nah. Let's ignore it. Okay. Accepting off the deceit and embarrassed, Geraldine excuses herself to make some calls. Let's just pretend they were trying to get money off her. Yeah. Let's just say it was that. Okay. Okay. The next thing I have is um, in the room, Carla finds out who the friend from America was. Yeah. Who was it? Maddie. It was, and I think she asks Jonathan if he misses her. Yeah, he kind of skates by that question and thinks about... Oh, he starts looking at a painting, which makes him think about the photo of the Yosemite. Mm -hmm. And he realises, I don't know if because she mentioned Maddie, that the smear may have been a kiss. And he then talks about the difference, or asks Carla if she knows the difference between landscape and portrait. Mm. So we're back downstairs where Jonathan takes the picture from the frame and what do we see behind it? It's a photo of Geraldine. And Mallory. Yes, he was hiding it from Ashley, apparently, because she's very 
jealous and may kill him? Yeah. <laughs> I don't really understand this. Let's just say he was a very private person. Yeah. I think, is it Mickey says that Ashley was obviously more than just a, a secretary? No, she wanted to be more than a secretary. Well, that's right, yeah. So because his secretary fancied him, he kept his entire love life a secret from everybody. More nonsense. You wouldn't do that. You would just say, eh, I'm not interested in you, Ashley. Stop trying to embalm yeah. me. I'm alive. And find a new secretary. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Geraldine is overhearing this. Yes. And then angrily exits and drives off as Carla doubts that Ashley would have killed him for rebuffing her. No. She doesn't think that's possible, but she doesn't know Ashley in any way. No. So how can she say this? She can't. In the car, as they follow, Carla points out that Ashley would have no motive to kill if she didn't know about Geraldine. Yes. So... So could it just be a, the, the rebuffal? Yeah, and did she even kill him? Mm. There's more of these flies in the car, which is quite annoying to everybody. Yes, Jonathan notices them on his hand and has a eureka moment. Hmm. We're at Ashley's house. Yeah, Geraldine shows up first and hears music. Um, I quite like this, I must admit. At first you're thinking, have they faked his death so he can live with yeah, Ashley? But yeah, I mean, it's a, the, the, we should say it's the jazz music that we heard uh, Mallory play at the start of the episode. I can tell you what the music is if you want to be able to save it for the trivia section. Um, oh, we're here now, tell us. Okay, so it's a 78 RPM record, apparently. A Petite Fleur by Sidney Bechet, a great favourite of David Renwick's and apparently also of Woody Allen's. Um, apparently there was originally some discussion between Geraldine and Carla about how much the track meant to Justin but they had to cut it mm. a nice track, I liked it so they're out in the garden, this music's playing and we see Ashley sitting beside it's, it's a long shot, so we see Ashley sitting beside Mallory and as you rightly said there the assumption must be, ah, it's been a, a faked death or at least she's faked and she's keeping him there like in misery mm. we're back in the car for a second Carla comments that there was something creepy about Ashley and Mickey tells them that perhaps she resented having to care for her father after his stroke although he has been dead for about two years now mm. back at Ashley's place it, Geraldine approaches the, the pair and discovers that it is not uh, an alive Justin being kept against his will by Ashley but an embalmed corpse in a wheelchair yeah, I must admit I, I did enjoy it I mean, it, it would have been more appropriate in a some sort of horror movie mm. I like it, but they could totally have weave, woven this into the story. Yeah. And had creepy music and stuff. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, it would have been better than some of the other subplots, like the Joseph thing. Yeah. Yeah. Geraldine attacks Ashley at this, calling her sick and twisted and a murdering bitch, as she is restrained by Mickey when the, the three of them run in. Yeah. Uh, Ashley denies having killed him, uh, Justin, and Jonathan says... He agrees it wasn't her, it was a fly. Yes. I think he also very perceptively says that Ashley needs help. I think that's quite obvious to everybody. Yeah. Beach house. Yes, Carla cannot believe that Ashley had all the embalming stuff there. No, but she is reminded that she did come from a family of undertakers. Yes. Jonathan expands by saying that he thinks Mallory knew how unstable Ashley was and didn't want to antagonise her by leaving... Uh, the picture of Geraldine around. That's not how you respond. You no. call the mental health people or whatever you need to do. Have a stage of intervention. Yeah, you don't hide your life from your secretary. Yeah, no, you don't. Jonathan also goes on to say that Mallory clearly loved Geraldine, so why would he get so upset about the facts? Yes. At and this point, I paused it and made a note. It better not be that a fly looked like an apostrophe or something stupid like that. <laughs> Yeah, well, unfortunately, through flashback, Jonathan goes on to explain what actually happened. Tell me. Oh, it wasn't an apostrophe, thankfully. It was a comma, which changed the meaning completely, and it's absurd and ridiculous. Yeah, only changed it completely if you spoke or uh, wrote in a, a very odd way. Yeah, it's contrived. Can you remember what the message was or the no, relevant part? I can't even remember the, the bit that was changed. I think it changed from him saying um, they no longer have to wait to know they have to wait longer or something. No, it was um, no one would have to suffer more and the apostrophe made it read uh, no, no one, one would, would have to suffer longer or more or something. But 
people aren't writing one yeah in that type of uh, message it, it reminds me of ghost's forge yes the idea for this is obviously come first and they've built a story around it is that not exactly what happened yeah yeah i think so i mean i can tell you for a fact it is what happened if you want me to tell you about it go for it david renwick is admitted i don't think he saw it as an admission mm -hmm. <laughs> confirmed that the whole thing with the harvest flies he gets inundated with them at his home where he did mm -hmm. at that time and he remembers one landing on a book or a writing pad and he thought oh that could be an apostrophe or a comma yeah. and then took the step to try and think what language would be changed by an apostrophe or a yeah. comma um i suppose we should be thankful that it wasn't four conveniently placed harvest flies changing the <laughs> yeah of course <laughs> Um, but yeah, I mean, the whole thing was a contrivance. I mean, the fact that she was using a fax, if it was a digital medium, then this wouldn't have worked. Yeah. Um, the language that was used and also there was something else. Well, the fly itself, I don't think. Yeah. You would have, uh, I don't think it would have looked natural. No. It would have been obvious. Mm hmm The final scene this week, we're on a boat where Jonathan and Carla are enjoying a little excursion. Whilst he explains Adam's problems with both the animal and little people's rights groups. Yeah, Carla's sure that Adam will rise above. That's the exact same joke that Adam made earlier on. Mm -hmm. We cut to a riot at the studio. <laughs> very yeah, briefly. he's being uh, attacked by protesters. <laughs> and Carla goes on to admit that she doesn't know where she is in her personal life and specifically with regards to Baxter. Yeah, but she's glad that right now she's got a bit of space. Yes, a bit of space from Baxter yeah however she doesn't no very short lived as he makes a surprise appearance yeah, he just pops up out the water in snorkelling gear yeah that's creepy very a little bit like I think we mentioned last week some horror references but that's a little bit like the end of Friday the 13th right bit less scary and there we have it yeah I think, again, I think that scene as well is she was starting to edge towards Jonathan there mm. she was Letting him know that things weren't 100% between yeah. her and her husband. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's a th mm, I would say it's a sort of B-minus episode for me. Don't know why I've started using the grading system. I've never done Just it before. Just this one week, yeah. yeah. I would say it was a 7. Okay. Don't know what it's out of. <laughs> Make up your own scale. It's out of 6. Yeah. But I thought it was quite entertaining, apart from the off-colour humour with the joseph storyline and the contrivances yeah. this was maybe the worst one for me in, at pulling you out the story mm -hmm. because it was so contrived I mean, not just one thing it was like two or three things were so contrived that they had to be so specific and jonathan had to get them in such an unlikely way it wasn't you know his usual deduction it was mm. more oh yeah i i think it must have been this way yeah yeah okay the 14th of February 2004 was the original air date and Sandy Johnson was back in the director's seat. Justin Mallory was played by Gary Cady, born in 1960. You might have seen him in Mona Lisa, Casualty, Doctors, Melissa, The Politician's Wife, Brass or Doctor Who. Jonathan Kidd played Mickey. He was born in 1956 and is a prolific voice actor. You'll certainly have heard him. He's been in the Mr. Bean Animations, The Quest, Chamber, Smith & Jones, The Bill, The Upper Hand, uh, One Foot in the Grave, Minder. He's the son of actor Sam Kidd and pro table tennis player Pinky Barnes. Fair enough. A very good house name there. Lorelai King played Geraldine Vaccaro and we've seen her before. Yes, in, um, what was it, Norman? Time mates for Norman, yes. This is her second of two appearances. She, I think, in that episode, played the American who confirmed the alibi. Yeah, the colleague. Yeah. She has appeared in Notting Hill, Bob the Builder, Mr. Bean Animations, Cold Feet, The Saint, Avenger Penguins, Phantom Cat, and Chef. She was voted the Female Performer of the Year at the Spoken Word Awards in 2001. I think she does a lot of work on Radio 4 as well. Okay. Creepy Ashley was played by Catherine Cusack and she was born in 1968. She has been in Finding Neverland, Doctor Who, Doctors, Ballycus Angel, The Bill and Coronation Street. I remember her as she played a psycho in that as well. 
She played a, a very similar character. Her name was Carmel. Okay. And I think she tried, I can't remember who it was, maybe Martin Platt, Gail's <laughs> young, younger tomboy husband, maybe. But she uh, she uh, wormed her way in there and became a bit of a psycho. Mm -hmm. Anyway, she's part of the Irish Cusack acting family. There's lots of them. Nicola Hughes played Felicia. She was born in 1975 and has appeared in Mount Pleasant, EastEnders Doctors, parents of the band, and was nominated for Olivia Award in 2001 and 7. Joseph was Jason Tompkins. He has been in Psychoville, Doctors, and The Pinocchio Effect. Can't say I've heard of The Pinocchio Effect. No. You've given some trivia already, haven't you? Yeah, I think most of it that was worth hearing. There was a couple of quotes from Alan Davis about punctuation, but I think we're mm. just as well without them. Yeah. The only thing I have is that all of the bugs were CGI'd. Really? Mm hmm Okay. Episode review. Motive. So we've got different motives here, haven't we? We've got the motive for the con. So that's the Pacific Company trying to... That was, that was bizarre. It was financial ridiculous. corporate shenanigans. Yeah. Uh, mental illness, I suppose, for the body disappearing and what she was up to. yeah, obsession. Mm -hmm. Clues, we've got the bugs, the email from Maddie, the smears, the landscape portrait thing, and the dictionary prick. Yeah, and the unusual choice of photograph for Reside the Bed, I think. Mm -hmm. I've not got you last week, is there? Um, well, yeah, but yeah, they're, they're away. They got away with it, is it? Yeah. Yeah, they didn't get the contract, though, so... Mm -hmm. Oh, they might. I don't know how Geraldine's going to decide that now. <laughs> and uh, the guilt, or again, there was no one was arrested, no one was going to court for this. No, I suspect that um, Ashley might end up in some form of institution. Hospital. Next time we have the checkered box. Exciting. I remember this one, yeah. One of, one of my personal favourites from back in the day. Let's hope it stands up. I think it's uh, Julius Awala's penultimate. Is it? Effort. Okay. We can discuss that as and when. Okay. Cheerio then. Bye bye.